With that, I would like to introduce our first panel, Food is Medicine's Impact on the Community. And I would like to invite all panel members to come forward and have a seat in the chair. And for me, this is one of the most important panels because this is where the activities actually impact people's lives. This panel will feature voices of individuals most closely engaged in food as medicine initiatives, including patients, community members, and those with lived experiences. Our panelists include NutriCare participant Ruth Comer, Brent Ling, who is Director of External Affairs at Wholesome Wave Produce, RX participant, Alice Mihea, Julian Miller, co-founding director of the Ruben V. Anderson Institute for Social Justice and assistant professor of political science at Tugalu College. The panel will be moderated by director of the Fluid is, is Medicine Institute, Dari. Ruth Comer's experience with cancer began 27 years ago when she was faced with a bladder cancer diagnosis. She has long fought hard and has gained invaluable insights into the significance of nutrition and its profound impact on well-being. Brent Ling is Director of External Affairs at Wholesome Wave, where he oversees their public health research initiatives and policy advocacy projects. This includes serving as Program Director for the National Produce Prescription Collaborative, where many of us collaborate to more fully integrate the produce prescription model into standard clinical practice. Alex Mejia is a devoted mother. She was asked to be part of the produce study, and this has been a great help in helping to change her and her kids' eating habits by incorporating fruit and vegetables into their meals. I'll just add that her two-month-old son is here in the audience. The experience has changed how she and her family view food. Attorney Julian Miller is the co-founding director of the Ruben V. Anderson Institute for Social Justice and Pre-Law Program and an assistant professor of political science at historic Tougaloo College. In his role at Tougaloo, he is also the co-principal investigator with Dr. and now Dean Chris Economos of the Delta Greens Food as Medicine Study in the Mississippi Delta as part of a five-year, $6.6 million NIH-funded grant that has forged a partnership between Tufts University, Tougaloo College, and the Ruben V. Anderson Center for Justice and Delta Health Center. Please join me in welcoming our panelists, and I'll now hand the podium over to our session moderator, Dari. Uh, so first, a welcome to all of you. Um, and I want to turn to each of you and ask just the very general question of your own experience in, in, this, in this field, wherever it, it, it may have come from, around food as medicine, and why you think this area is important. And so Ruth, uh, we'll start with you. You live in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, in February uh, of this year, you were diagnosed with stage 4 metastatic uh, lung cancer. Uh, and had lost about 10% of your weight, um, and you're not a giant, and so 10% of your weight is a lot. Um, and, and about two months after your diagnosis, uh, heard about and enrolled in a Tufts uh, project, the NutriCare study. I would just want to tell me about your experience uh, before, after your diagnosis, leading up to getting enrolled in the study, and then, and then what your experience was like on the study. Well, at the beginning, I noticed that my left arm was hurting. I went to the doctor. I was losing weight also, and I was fatigued. I went to the doctor, and the doctor didn't think anything was wrong. Just, just hold on. Oh, yeah. The doctor didn't think anything was wrong, so it took a while before that they did give me an x-ray. Once I received the x-ray, they saw that I had a mass, a large mass, stage four cancer in my lung. 
I'll start treatments, I say about a month or a little bit more than a month after. At my first treatment, I was told about a study and would, like, would I like to join into this study, which I said yes. And I joined the study. I had lost quite a lot of weight. And this was a food study, nutrition. Once I got into the study, I found out that I was receiving food. I received the food, didn't have to pay for it. The food was already cooked. I did not have to cook, which helped out a whole lot. And the food was good. <laughs> and I enjoyed the food. <laughs> I started gaining weight. But at times, I did lose weight again. And I also was fatigued. But the food and the treatments, as I went longer, it started happening, started working. I gained more strength. I gained weight. And everything started improving. Now I have my uh, mass have strength more than 50%. And it's just like a matter of months. And I know it also had to do with the food and the nutrition because it made me stronger. So I was able to fight the cancer. And I am very happy about the study that I am in. So, so the, the program that the NutriCare study funded by the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation uh, is enrolling patients randomized trial from across the country with, with metastatic lung cancer to test the impact of medically tailored meals. Those are provided by mail by uh, MANA uh, in, in Philadelphia, which is uh, one of the Food is Medicine Coalition partners along with community servings here in Boston and, and others. Can you talk about beyond the meals and the prepared meals, the role of nutrition, counseling, and guidance that you received as part of the study. Cancer patients can't receive uh, reimbursed counseling by an RDN, right? It's just not, it's not reimbursed. If you have cancer, you, you, can't, you have to pay for it yourself or you can't see one. But in the study, she was able to get uh, RDN counseling. What was that uh, like and how, did that, was that helpful? Yes. Well, one thing, I did not have to cook. I got counseling that was telling me what foods I should be eating. I received uh, counseling each week up by phone, which was very helpful because she told me certain foods and different things I didn't even know about. And which, well, also she described ways of eating that I didn't do. I was only eating <laughs> multi my whole life. I just only eat about one meal a day. And she informed me about, you know, different foods I could eat, things that would be really nutrition that I didn't know about. And it really did help out a whole lot. Also, the payment, you know, for food and stuff like that by getting it free, if the government and your insurance company would put in a little bit more, you know, to help out, that would also be uh, good because a lot of patients, uh, cancer patients, they don't have the money or even ways to, you know, get to the grocery stores and things like that to get food and stuff. But if it was like the government would come and help out with uh, more allowance and things for some cancer patients, and they do help with some of the patients, but still <laughs> certain patients like don't receive enough allowance and things like that for uh, the food. Well, well, thank you for coming from Columbus to here to tell your story. And we'll come back to you for a second question on kind of what you would like to see in the healthcare system. Um, maybe next we'll go to Brent and then come back to Alice and then to Julian. So Brent, tell us th uh, a little bit about yourself and your role and kind of what, you're, what you see and what you're excited about in food as medicine. Um, Thank you, Dari, and uh, I'm very happy to be here um, on this panel. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I think our story at Wholesome Wave isn't particularly unique to anybody in this room. Uh, we um, believe in the world changing for the better, and we do that through food. Um, we, uh, we do research programs, um, and, and we assess ways to 
bridge the gap so that folks, no matter their circumstances, intentional or not, um, have access to uh, the ability to put food on their table that they want to. And then we um, are a small team, we have a big goal, and we work to advocate um, and, and share the stories that are here and, and other places with policymakers in DC um, to make sure that they can, and we encourage them to uh, test it and expand it and, and bring it to more people, these, these great stories that happen um, at the local level. Um, so we are uh, really excited about food as medicine for, for the same obvious reasons, it works. Um, and it's a great thing to advocate for because it helps so many people. Um, there's the folks in this room um, who on, on, the, on the panel with me who have um, received it as a patient, um, but we also get countless stories from all over the country from doctors who are thrilled to have access to the tool. Um, same with farmers and food retailers who have access to new customers and feel like they're betting, better reaching the needs of their customers. Um, so in that case of advocating for the program and expanding it so that is reachable to everybody, um, we really uh, like to support efforts that uh, help so many different people along the way. Um, so that's our excitement about food as medicine. I imagine it's very similar for everyone else um, in the room. Yeah. Can t tell, tell us a little bit about kind of some of the things Wholesome Wave is working on now, just, just briefly. Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, right now, specifically, uh, we have uh, produce prescription programs in the field that are investing deeply in questions related to um, fidelity, equity, and dignity. Um, for the communities that we're serving. Um, equity is a, uh, health equity in particular, um, has been indicated by uh, the presidential administration here as being a top priority. Um, you mentioned it in your uh, opening remarks, Dari, that um, nutrition security is inherently an equity tool, a tool to advance health equity. Um, so we uh, have done a lot of patient-centered co-design through the process. We've engaged prospective patients who would be uh, involved in the study in the study design from the get-go. Um, so they get to exercise their research shops in addition to hopefully receiving the prescription someday and then um, being a part of the uh, dissemination onward after that. Um, so that's one particular program. Um, we also facilitate the National Produce Prescription Collaborative uh, where we work with a lot of folks in this room um, to tell the story in DC about uh, what's happening on the ground um, and look for opportunities to expand utilization and reach of the program. Great, thank you, Brent. And, and we're proud at, at Tufts to be one of the founding members of the National Produce Prescription Collaborative that's led by Wholesome Wave. So thank you for, for all that work. Um, let's turn to um, Alice, Alice Mejia. Um, uh, she's from Mattapan, uh, not too far from here, and um, found she was pregnant earlier this year, about, about 16 weeks. And as mentioned, her uh, son, uh, 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 Janai, is here in the audience, now sleeping. Um, <laughs> um, so kind of remarkable that, that we're seeing the generational uh, impact, uh, the positive impact of, of, of food as medicine. Uh, Alice, tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your, your story of, of the, your uh, um, experience with this program, what it, what it did or didn't do for you and your family. Um, I remember, like you said, I was like four months pregnant uh, when I joined uh, the program, and without hesitation, I said yes. Because <laughs> usually, um, before the program, um, I wasn't really the most healthiest eater. But I'm like, okay, let me incorporate now that I'm pregnant, see how um, my energy levels is at, and it impacted me and my family a lot. Like, I was getting, well... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Aside from it being free, like the delivery portion was like amazing. I didn't have to go anywhere. The kids were excited, like, oh, a box is downstairs. They'll go get it for me. And I'm trying to figure out like, oh, I never had this before. I never had, you know, trying new things. And um, I want to give a shout out to my fiance because um, <laughs> he would prep all the meals for me, I didn't, even though I didn't know what to do. And sometimes... Um, <laughs> With, um, Jalal, fancy Jalal is here. Yes. <laughs> and at times, um, sometimes a delivery box would come with like um, suggestions on what to do with what came in the box. So, for example, you know, there was like type of shake or smoothie or type of meal, and I was like, I tried it a couple times, and I did like it, and it did make me feel good. Uh, and and can you talk a little bit about? Kind of the you have other children, right? Yeah, and, I do and, have other children. And so, can you talk a little bit about the impact on them? And did they oh, yeah, try new things? To, and yeah, how, did. how did it change their experience with food and, and groceries? I always had to mix it with something, so they didn't never knew like, oh, this is in it. But they was like, oh, this is so good. Like, yeah, what is it? And I was just like, it's a secret recipe. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, there was a little bit sad or upset that <laughs> right before the baby came, there was no more surprises <laughs> that they would call it. There's no box. Like, but I'm like, it's okay. Um, but. So, so the program ended the as program your pregnancy ended, ended. As my pregnancy ended, and, and and how is how what has that felt like? You know, um, very. I mean, pretty different now because it's not as fresh as the local <laughs> supermarkets. But um, I do over the over time hope that there's more resources and things like that, so other people can actually kind of um, be involved in getting actually good produce products. Yeah. And, and and can you describe some of the contents of the boxes? What were some of your favorite boxes? Um, that was funny. That's a good one. Because there was, I got, I mean, I like the lion mushrooms, which I never got to try up until the the box. Uh, <laughs> arugulas, I love those. Um, those are like pretty much my, my yeah. favorites. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing your story. And, and um... <laughs> And sharing the the um, your son with us today, which is amazing, and your fiance, and we'll come back to you. I think we'll have time to ask you know sort of what would you like to see for others if this could become you know a, a different program. So, uh, so Julian, uh, last and certainly not not least, I've had the pleasure to get, to get to know you. We've been on some panels. You visited the school in your work with with um, Chris Economos. Uh, tell us a little bit about you know yourself and and this the, maybe this project uh, and and why you know what you. How, you, how you're in the area of food as medicine, yeah. Uh, certainly. Um, and thank you, Alexander, for being here. I'm so grateful for this partnership with Tufts and Chris. You know, you're amazing. So, um, also, I am a fifth-generation Mississippi Delta, and you all saw the map about probably the most in food insecure and probably has the uh, has indicators at the level of third-world countries for disease, uh, infant mortality, you name it, and so, and certainly for diarrhea illnesses, and so, I mean, it's something that's real. So, like, on a personal note, like, literally within a span of 15 years, from 2008 to 2023, I buried my grandmother and all of her children, including my mother, in that span, and she had six children, including my mother. Every single one of them had either cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, or some permutation of which, and all passed because of it. So it's it's real. It's almost normalized in being from that area. You will have someone that will die or suffer because of a diarrheal illness or chronic illness. It's just it's your it's it's completely normalized. And so when I did begin doing anti poverty work after college, between college and law school. Which is here in Boston, right? Yes. He yes. was at Harvard yes. for your training. And yes. Back and so, in Mississippi. Yeah. yeah, so when I came back, obviously when we were thinking about um, doing, you know, anti-poverty organizing and work we do, obviously food system, food justice work, and intersection with public health was number one. That was not, that was not, you know, it wasn't a calling or something like, oh, you know, I didn't have options. That's literally what I knew <laughs> to do because at the time of the Delta, there was an emerging food system, a movement. Uh, that, you know, has a history with Tufts and Delta Health Center, you know, it began with, you know, the food is medicine there and, and uh, prescribing patients to go to the 427 acre farm there. And so fast forward, uh, there had been a movement around building locally grown food systems because we're mostly dominated by corporate agriculture in the Delta. In Delta, even though we have the second most fertile soil in the world, only next to the Nile. And so... So the work I involved in for 16 years was building community food systems, building capacity for local food systems, and then marrying that to being able to uh, address both food insecurity and public health disparities by normalizing, trying to normalize that system so people had access to locally grown uh, uh, fresh produce. And so I was fortunate uh, to do this work over 16 years, build capacity with the founding of an organization called Delta Fresh Foods Initiative, do the work in the Delta, and then when I joined the faculty at Tugalu College, we started the Anderson Center, building the only um, worker-owned, student worker-owned uh, farm and food system on HBCU campus in the country. And so uh, we kind of built the capacity, and then we made food as medicine a priority, and then one fortunate phone call to an amazing dean, uh, at the time, Fortune's Dean, uh, about doing a food as medicine grant in 26 days. And our partner who was going to do it with us, our partner who was going to do the grant with us from PHA dropped out and said, I can't do it. And so and she and I had this awkward look like, we can give this a shot 26 days later in March. Literally, the rest was history. And so we were able to launch uh, what is one of the largest uh, food as medicine studies in the country uh, that will that is allows for randomized control and it allows for both uh, 
looking at addressing, trying to get a, a, allow for the proliferation of locally grown produce to address chronic illness, at the same time leveraging it to try to still build the food system in the Mississippi Delta, which is still not at a level that's sustainable enough to be able to uh, have a greater proliferation of uh, uh, locally grown fresh produce to address food, food insecurity and chronic health. So I'm so excited to be on this journey, uh, which began, you know, almost 60 years ago uh, with the founding of Delta Health Center in Tufts to be here again, and now uh, trying to do this in a very sustainable way. Yeah, am amazing. And, and uh, you know, for, for folks that don't know the story, the, the, the launch of the community health care centers was by Dr. Jack Geiger, who was a Tufts uh, medicine physician, first, uh, first in um, uh, uh, Roxbury, Dorchester. I can't remember. I think it was in Dorchester. I think first in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and then very soon after the first rural community health care center uh, in the Mississippi Delta, which is the same uh, community health care center that now Chris uh, and Julian are partnering with uh, to grow, help black farmers grow specialty crops and get those specialty crops to patients with diabetes or prediabetes and, and improve their health or so create kind of this, this, this cycle. And um, when uh, Dr. Geiger created that health care center in Mississippi, he had, it was in 67, 66, I think, and he did not have a supportive Republican governor, uh, or maybe a Democratic governor, I don't know. He did not have a supportive governor. Um, to try to you know, improve the health of, of, of uh, low-income minority folks. And so they were always looking over his shoulder and trying to figure out what he was doing with the grants and funding that he had from the state and the federal government. And they heard that Dr. Geiger was doing a food as medicine program. He was writing literal paper prescriptions for food that the patients would go take to the local grocery store. The grocery store would send the bill to uh, Dr. Geiger and he would pay for it from his pharmacy, from his pharmacy fund. And so the governor sent down uh, an, an inspector, and he came in screaming and yelling, literally screaming and yelling at Dr. Geiger, saying, you can't do this. You're breaking the law. This is not right. You're, you're misappropriating funds, and you know, you know, we're going to shut you down. And uh, Dr. Dr. Geiger looked at him and said, you know, well, the last time I looked in my medical textbooks, the specific treatment for, for malnutrition was food. <laughs> Shut him up, and he went back to back to the governor's office and left him alone. So, so really, that was the first kind of you know modern food as medicine uh, program in the United States. And so, it's exciting to have this connection back, um, you know, back again in your own, your own commitment. Um, and so, I, I want to turn back to each of the panelists again, and we'll we'll start start back over here with Ruth. Um, what would you like to see? What would be where, five years from now? What would make you ha What would you like to see the healthcare system? You know, do around around food or some of these programs for, for patients like yourselves or others. Well, I would like the health care. Hold this up, yeah. I would like the health care system to give allowance to people so that they would be able to receive to get the produce that is needed to help them to uh, you know for the food that well is very essential for them for the diseases that they have. Yeah. Wh wh when did your program end? My program ended about, uh, I would say, about two or three weeks ago. Just two or three weeks ago. And, yes. And, and how, how, how has things been w without the program compared to with the program? Well, without the program, I am now in the kitchen cooking. <laughs> uh, which is uh, taking time away and also going to the store, trying to pay those high prices for the food I have to do now and gas for the car to get to. I mean, everything is so expensive and I think you know and I'm not <laughs> don't receive that much you know money each month and although I do receive enough and I live with my daughter that I am able to you know buy food and stuff but a lot of people are not able to and I think that at least for those people and even for people with you know like low income you know the government should have F care I mean insurance should uh, you know, give allowance to people, you know, for the food and stuff that they need. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we talked about it earlier today when we met and we're speaking that, you know, your household income level is pretty low, um, but not low enough to qualify for SNAP. Mm -hmm. um, and so and so you're, um, you know, having trouble and struggling financially, but there's no nowhere to, to turn for, to turn to turn for help. And it sounds like that program, at least for the six months that you were on it, was was very helpful. And glad 
you know, we were uh, able to, to work with you on that. And I hope, you know, again, the goal, one of the goals of the Food and Medicine Institute, that this, we really show that the, the value and benefits of these things is worth normalizing. So this isn't something that's turned on and off. You know, pe pe people have asked me, well, how long are we going to do some of these programs for some people? And I said, well, when I prescribe a cholesterol lowering drug or a blood pressure lowering drug or a diabetes drug, nobody asks me, well, how long are you going to give it to the, they get it as long as they need it. Some people might need it for three months. Some people might need it for six months. Some people might need it their whole life. And that's OK. I mean, that's what, that's what we do with healthcare. We decide who, who needs what program for, for how long. So, so I hope we're going to get on the path and on the journey where, where you're, what you're thinking about be, becomes more real. Well, also, I yeah, think please. you know that uh, they should you know, help with the counseling. You know, dietitians, people to explain foods and you know the different kind of foods that they should be eating and what they should be eating. Yeah. And they need help, you know, with people doing that, you know, because most people are not informed. Yeah. Ha ha has it changed your own thinking about what you eat now? Uh, uh, oh, really? <laughs> a whole lot. What I eat and how much I eat, and you know, it has really changed it. I know that how important it is. Yeah. You know, you know the you know to fight the uh, diseases. Yeah, food is to fight them. Yeah, thank you, uh, Julian. What, where, where would you like to see, you know, five years from now in this field of food as medicine? Where would you like to see the world? Yeah, or the country and <laughs> the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're ambitious, darling. <laughs> in so, I mean, for me, I think, I think, and I can sort of speak to the certainly speak to the perspective of the work we're doing um, in Mississippi. Uh, definitely that there is a um, in more states and God can knock on wood in Mississippi too. We'll see. We're always last or everything, but that there is there are Medicaid one 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 five B waivers that are passed that allows for uh, Medicaid dollars to be allowed to pay for prescription drugs, pay for food the same way it pays for prescription drugs. I think that will be transformative both for um, making the food system economically sustainable, while at the same time making sure that it has integration in the in the, in the public health system. So. Uh, we're as part of our food as medicine project, for example, one of the things, you know, we did uh, a formative evaluation before we were doing our distribution uh, in, a, in a few months. And one of the things we made sure we talked to doctors as uh, and healthcare providers as part of that to get their input as well as patients. And additionally, we're doing a uh, establishing local food policy councils. And we're doing that because we want to, you know, a part of the work will be sort of normalizing uh, eating fresh foods as part of your diet, making it part of your cook, making it part of your lifestyle. We know that's going to be key in making that so so people so people normalize that so doctors can begin to think. Okay, uh, we need to make sure we incorporate diet uh, as part of treatment, and therefore now we would have Medicaid making sure for those patients to pay for it. Then we address food insecurity, we, and we are able, able to provide them this medical service. And then of course we're making the uh, 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 food system sustainable. So that would go a long way. Uh, uh, into really advancing food as medicine before you can get to the federal level. Yeah, absolutely. All the states can innovate. Yeah, um, Alice, what would you, uh, br you know, br just br briefly in a few words, what would you like to see in you know a year or two or, or, or more, you know, happen in healthcare around food? Um, that is more for it to be more accessible, to, especially for those who um, is not available to get it, but be able to, you know, to incorporate healthy lifestyle. Um. Yeah, un until you were in this program, did you get a lot of counseling or input on healthy lifestyle in, in your health in your healthcare with doctors to visit, or, or was this kind of a more meaningful? More meaningful. Yeah. We yeah. do a survey and ask how it's going, and you know if I'm benefiting from it, if it's enough, if it's not enough. To me, it was enough. Um, and like I said. I would like now I'm getting stuff from the local markets and it's not lasting me as long as my delivery would um, when I would receive it when I would receive it I feel like you know it stay fresh for a while yeah it don't go bad and it take and it actually really tastes good the delivery has is pretty uh, substantial because delivery can really change access for for um, having kids for, is yeah it's hard to yeah. like just go to the supermarket and they yeah. want everything. <laughs> Brent, what would you like to see where the world um, yeah. I've got three, but they will be quick. Um, one, I think Mississippi Medicaid should be able to cover produce uh, prescriptions and other food as medicine without having to go through a waiver process. It should be standard part of all Medicaid. Um, and 
Um, that's maybe the five-year um, goal. Um, maybe even a little bit before that. Um, this one's more practical. We're in baseball season now. I would like to watch a World Series in a couple of years and see a call your doctor and ask your doctor about a produce prescription commercial. Um, I think that would be that would be the indicator that we're all succeeding in this work. I think really well, um, and the private sector is on board too. Um, but this is where the Food as Medicine Institute I think will will come in most importantly, um, and I think this is the most um, impactful one. Um, and I'm going to call it FIMI. Um, and we'll see if that sticks. That's, that's unauthorized, but we'll go with FIMI for, for a while. Um, I think we need MedPAC and MACPAC, um, and this is for some uh, policymakers in the room, um, MedPAC and MACPAC to make a coverage determination on food as medicine, on all the types of food as medicine in the pyramid um, that exists. And to get there, um, these interventions have to go through an FDA-level clinical trial. Um, and I think that's where you guys will, will come in, um, certainly, as we go along. Um, and that, that coverage determination, even if it isn't 100% coverage, it will, be a, it will push a lot of doors open for us as we go along. So those are my hopes. Wonderful. Well, we have um, one randomized control trial we've just completed with, with Kaiser Permanente and, and FoodSmart uh, uh, in, in patients uh, who are on Medicaid with type 2 diabetes in Southern California. Um, we're going to be reporting that in a few weeks at the American Heart Association, so the first and largest uh, randomized trial of, uh, in diabetes. Um, Kaiser is launching another randomized trial now. Uh, with We're participating with Instacart, 1,100 patients with diabetes um, in all throughout California, um, which I think will be, again, a, a seminal trial. And then we're, we're hoping to, to launch a, a similar-sized definitive randomized trial uh, in high-risk pregnancy in Georgia. Um, where Kaiser has a, a big footprint, um, either with funding from Kaiser or we've also thinking about some federal sources. So I think that would be three definitive trials, and that could be enough, right, to then submit a, a coverage determination. So um, it's it's not that far away that this this could be real for for you know, millions of Americans. So so I really want to just say thank you to the panel um, for mostly for the, what you're doing every day when you're not here, all the work that you're doing for you, you know, Ruth taking care of yourself and your daughter. For you, Alice, taking care of yourself and your family and the work you do with in, in, in your community, and Brent and Julian for the incredible work that, that you do as well. Um, uh, you can just see the cross-section of, of people for whom food as medicine is important and interesting and powerful and meaningful. And this is a cross-section of America, right? And, and um, this is really important for, I think, every, every state. And I'll just close and say you talked about international. We are doing food as medicine trials in Australia right now. We just had a call with a foundation in Canada who's interested in potentially doing this. Someone from the, the Treasury at the UK called me and said they're interested about food as medicine. But one of the most interesting conversations I had just a couple weeks ago, I met a minister of health for a large uh, you know, low-income low nation, and she had no idea what I did. We just met at a reception, and, and she had been very, she's a very successful minister of health for her country. And I said, what's your top priority for the coming you know, couple of years now? And now that COVID is sort of you know, quieting down, she said, nutrition. And you know, that was kind of mu music to my ears. And I said, great, you know, what, what conditions are you thinking about? Thinking she was going to say vitamin A deficiency in kids or stunting or wasting. She said stroke and cancer. You know, it's devastating our country. And so, and so we talked about food as medicine. And she's very interested and has introduced me to her staff now to talk about maybe a possible food as medicine trial in her country. So there's real interest. And I hope, although our focus will be in the U.S., that this can also you know, extend to other nations. So thank you so much. Thank you, to everybody. Please uh, give everyone a round of applause. Thank you.